So welcome everyone to this very special event with the Asian American Center's inaugural cohort of fellows. We are so delighted to welcome the three of them all together in the same, same Zoom room at the same time. I'm Heidi Kim. I am the director of the Asian American Center. And really one of the things that I am proudest of building this year is this fellows program. And tonight's event was proposed by these wonderful and generous fellows themselves as a way of cultivating Asian American projects on our campus. Um, because as many of you know, that has not been a really big and visible part of our curriculum. So I will briefly introduce the panelists. And then what we will do is have a brief panel where they will answer questions about how they conceive of their work on Asian American topics and communities. After that, those of you who signed up and indicated a workshop project when you registered will be invited to join a breakout room with one of the panelists and perhaps myself. I may also jump in to help make the workshops a little more intimate. So we'll, we'll see how our numbers are looking. Um, so introductions first. Uh, Dr. Aiko Day joins us from the Department of English and Critical Social Thought at Mount Holyoke College. She is the author of Alien Capital, Asian Racialization and the Logic of Settler Colonial Capitalism, which came out from Duke University Press in 2016. Her research focuses on the visual culture and literature of Asian North America. She spoke at a jointly hosted AAC uh, event earlier this year and gave a really wonderful talk on affirmative action and whiteness as property. Um, that's available on our website for UNC affiliates and I really urge you to watch that if you haven't yet. We also have with us Rajiv Mohabir, who is a faculty member in the BFA MFA program in writing, literature and publishing at Emerson College. He is an award-winning Indo-Caribbean poet and translator of poetry. His first book of poetry, The Taxidermist Cut, exposes the wounds of com coming of age as a queer brown youth. And his translation, I Even Regret Night, Holy Songs of Demerara, um, is a translation of Lal Bihari Sharma's 1916 book of poems, which is the only known literary work by an indentured servant in the Anglophone Caribbean. And finally, Dr. Natasha Sharma of the Department of African American Studies and the Program in Asian American Studies at Northwestern University brings to the AAC Fellows a focus on the relationships between racialized peoples, specifically the intersections of Black, Native, and Asian America. In her forthcoming book, Hawaii is My Haven, Race and Indigeneity in the Black Pacific, she explores essential questions regarding race, identity, art, and place. And I should say that uh, Rajiv's wonderful reading and conversation, which celebrated Holy, is also available on our Facebook and our YouTube channels. And um, Natasha's workshop is soon to follow, as soon as we can get the video edited. So I invite you to learn more about their work after tonight. Um, so to move to our questions, um, I'll start off with thinking about what we all hope to have, which is audience. So who is your audience when you are creating an Asian American studies, artistic or community-based project? Who do you think of as your audience, Psycho? That's a great question. Um, I think that it, the concept of audience really changes over the course of you know, an academic lifetime, I suppose, when I, I think when we begin our work, you know, we're not always thinking in terms of audience and hoping that we can actually maybe create or discover an audience. Uh, particularly uh, for me, I was working on a project uh, on settler colonialism and race um, as a graduate student. And that was not really a well-known topic. People thought it was obscure <laughs> and weird. And, and so I think that, um, you know, it didn't necessarily have a ready-made audience at the time. So, um, so I think that, you know, at the, in those moments, you, you don't really know who your audience will be. 
Um, but at the same time, I think that I've always, because I'm from Canada um, and um, can Asian Canadians often have kind of a chip on their shoulder because Asian Canadians often get kind of folded into an Asian American kind of, you know, artistic or critical or cultural paradigm. I've always thought that, you know, Asian Canadians are kind of part of the audience that I want to bring sort of specificity to, um, while also showing how linked um, Asian Canadians and Asian Americans are um, through the, through kind of uh, an analysis of settler colonialism. Um, more recently, um, I think I've become much more, and I've learned a lot just from having um, Indigenous and Black communities um, as audience members, and that's uh, and so that's also um, really enriched the way that I think about um, how I'm approaching questions of race, Blackness in relation to Asian American contexts. Thanks, Aiko. Others, feel free to jump in. I'm not gonna keep cold calling you. <laughs> um, I'll go next. Um, writing for me is like the most painful part of my job. I feel like it's the hardest and um, you know, yet we keep on doing it. So audience is a really interesting question. Um, I think I'm much more um, focused on the academic um, on the ac academic audience. Um, but that said, I think that each I have um, of both of my big of both of my projects or both of my books, it kind of has like a twin level audience. So um, my work on South Asian American hip hop artists was really trying to bring together South Asian American studies, black studies and hip hop studies. And so my audience was sort of scholars who are interested in these things. But I also wrote the book in a way that I hope was helpful and appealing or told the stories of and to South Asian American hip hop artists or to South Asian Americans um, who are not necessarily within the academy. Um, my more recent um, book, um, you know, it also I hope does this twin level thing. And I, and I think it's, it's very accessible in the way that I wrote it. Um, it hopes to bring together um, Black Studies, Native Studies, and Pacific Island Studies. So again, a scholarly audience, um, ideally at the undergraduate, graduate, and, and faculty level. But I also want it to be sort of, it's an ethnography of Black people in Hawaii. And so I want Black people in Hawaii to be able to read it and see themselves reflected in that as well. So again, it's sort of this multiple level um, goal. Um, but still, I'll just end by saying that when I'm writing, somehow the writing that I read never exactly sounds like me. So when I speak and I lecture, that's who I truly am. And when I read my writing, I'm not sure who whose voice that is. So it's something I haven't been able to really tackle yet, the question of voice. And would you feel like we, we have to have your point of view on this as a poet and translator? Yeah, totally. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And thank you, um, both Aiko and Natasha for your answers. Um, because like, I feel like, you know, it's uh, to respond, Natasha, directly to what you had said about uh, finding your voice and you're much more of your voice when you're speaking. I feel as, as somebody who is more introverted, it's quite opposite for me that my actual voice is the written thing that I produce or that I make or like the process that I, that I, that I go through making it. Um, you know, as poets, we're constantly um, you know, obsessed with the idea of audience because it's so niche anyway to be a poet because the people who read poems, yeah, like, you know, Hallmark card uh, creators, uh, you know, folks on uh, with, with viral poems that are shared online very quickly, but then also really, you know, who is the audience for, for a poem? And, you know, my, my hope is that it's for everybody, but then as the moment, as, as my poems unfold and I, I, I let more and more of my own personal complications of identity and language, you know, sprawl across the page, like the smaller my, my audience becomes. So, you know, it turns out that maybe my audience was, is myself or like an, a younger Rajiv. Um, and in that way, maybe it's for, you know, people also in my community, you know, the publishing world in the United States is something like 90% white, according to a study that was shown. And of that, how many people are Asian American? Of that, how many people are Indo-Caribbean? It's like, there are no other, like, uh, as I was coming up, the, the, the Indo-Caribbean poets that I looked to were people in um, Canada, in the UK, and also in the Caribbean. Um, there hasn't been much, uh, uh, 
produced or published in the United States. Not to say that Indo-Caribbean poets who were in the United States weren't publishing elsewhere, because that certainly was the case. Um, so when I think about audience, I think about platform creation also mm -hmm. on, a, on a broader kind of field. So, uh, but the translation projects, that's a different kind of situation where I'm definitely thinking about my translation project projects for, you know, a community that I belong to or for, you know, this kind of, uh, you know, music or story or song that has been kind of obscured, either its meanings or the actual text itself. Thank you. I think that raises a really interesting point because there's, first of all, how you think about community, right? So you were kind of refining it down. Um, you were thinking about Indo-Caribbean poets, right, or Indo-Caribbeans in the U.S. Um, so how do you, you know, who is your community? And how do you think about your responsibility to your community when you're working on a project and putting a project out into the world? How heavily does that weigh on you? Might be projecting a little bit of myself in there. <laughs> I, I can just maybe get this started. Um, this brings gives me flashbacks to, again, to graduate school. Um, because I, as a, someone who did my PhD in ethnic studies, there was definitely kind of a a division amongst graduate students, you know, those who were dedicated and devoted to this idea of community and those of us, or, and I will, you know, who were sort of uh, really just theory heads. <laughs> so there was a kind of theory and praxis uh, division and, and the question of what is community came up all the time. Um, you know, what is our community? Is it, are the, and what are our connections as people in academia to, communities in Oakland or or wherever um, or is our community actually in you know you know a, a bunch of graduate students and professors um, so uh, that um, I'm just throwing that out there as without resolving it but I think that that was a constant tension but I think it's a useful tension because it does make you all it, it forces a certain kind of self-reflection all the time and um, and thinking about how community often shifts and none of these None of these points are static, you know? Um, and um, so I'll just let someone else take up that question as well. To mix it up, Rajiv, you wanna go next? Sure, yeah. You know, that's, that's, so, that's so wonderful, this question, because, and thank you, Aiko, for the problematics that arise from even considering, what does it mean, you know, right now we have, you, you know, us, we are in a community at the moment. So uh, it used to be in my grandparents' generation, the community was the people who lived around them. I don't even know my neighbors' names. Um, so here's like quandary. Uh, but I think about that too. And I think about it in, you know, a maybe this is a, a facile answer, but thinking about uh, who my identity or who, you know, the community is could be like who I am currently allied with. Um, and I think like that's a thing that I think about too. Um, because like you, th there's the, the, the easier answer of like, okay, I talk about my familial community and then like, you know, the cultural community and then like immigrant community. And then it just kind of like in these concentric circles but, and then it becomes meaningless, right? Because then we're like our human community, so. Yeah, I think I think my approach um, is is an echo of exactly what's been said. So when people talk about community, and this is really relevant within Asian American studies, right, or the ethnic studies, when the idea is that students want to see themselves represented in the curriculum, and they want to learn about their cultures and their communities, right, and their identities. Um, and so when people ask me about community, I just reframe that by thinking, who are my people? And I actually think that's a slightly different question or way of framing it. Um, so for me, I don't have community based on identity, it's based on politics. And that's what I think Rajiv is mentioning, right, is that, um, that it's really not based on being Indian, Russian, Jewish from Hawaii, um, all two of us, me and my brother, like that's not going to be my community. Um, so, so really, I don't think about building and um, living with and um, 
being in community with people based on shared identities. I mean, I definitely have an academic community, as Aiko is also talking about, but really my people are, are, are both the people I know and that imagined community of people, exactly as Rajiv is saying, with who, who shares the same worldview as me. And that's really what motivates all of my research is that I'm accountable for complicity with or eradication of all systems of power. I mean, that's really my goal is for a more equitable society. And so in that case, my community are those who are really working toward that same goal. So it is, it could be so expansive as to be meaningless, but maybe it's so expansive as to become um, so strong and powerful and beautiful that we can finally overturn those things. So yeah, my community is who my people are, and that has never been limited to my given and identities. It's really about my politics. If I could just um, add to the other comments too, I think that um, bringing this back again to just the the idea of Asian America, I mean, I think that this is a term that suggests a community or pan ethnic community, and and that's I feel like a little bit, especially now as we're seeing all of this anti Asian violence, um, we're seeing that a huge rift or a gap between kind of an academic kind of understanding of what. Asian America is, um, you know, what we teach our students, what we think of representation, and then probably who Asian Americans actually are, um, which are very different from the sort of 1960s era group who kind of mobilized around kind of yellow power or Asian American kind of um, collective identity. Um, now we're, we, we have an Asian American population that's so internally diverse, such that, you know, you can at one time be one of the sort of have the highest median income sort of nationally, but then also be the uh, the population with the greatest amount of poverty in New York state. So we're talking about a massively internally diverse community and many of these, and most of them being immigrants rather than in the sort of pre-1965 immigration act. So, um, so, I mean, I think that this question, I think of, of community is especially difficult for thinking through, um, you know, an Asian American project and um, so I, I'll just, I just wanted to add that um, because it does seem like probably most immigrants, whether they're Asian American or Latinx or what have you, probably what they care about the most are, you know, healthcare and education, <laughs> and they could care less about maybe questions of race, maybe questions of, of um, you know, whether or not they are anti-communist or, you know, whether, uh, you know, decolonizing places, you know, maybe that is just like the farthest thing from their minds. <laughs> and so uh, bridging that gap, I think, is one of the challenges that we have going forward. And I want to, oh. yeah, hey. well, I was just going to say that um, in Asian American studies at Northwestern, we have um, recently gotten the right to offer a major uh, in Asian American studies. And so part of what we developed as what you need to do to graduate with a major in Asian American studies is to have a community-based project. And that's really not my area of expertise, but we have people who have very strong ties with um, various Asian American communities and organizations in, in the Chicago area. Um, and I appreciate that kind of applied focus and that focus that does harken back to, I think the roots of right ethnic studies. And so you have this kind of multiple modes and questions of what is an Asian American studies project going to look like? How, how accountable to people who are identify as Asian around us um, should our projects really speak to them and of them? And what happens when we're in Asian American studies and we don't center right um, Asian descended people? That's also a question, right? That maybe um, will come up. Yeah, I was wondering, especially, and this this might not be applicable for all of you, but you know, we we called this how to create an Asian American project writ large, right? But when you're doing inter-ethnic work, right, within this very large, diverse group. Do any of you have qualms or have you encountered resistance with that? Um, I wouldn't say I've encountered resistance, but you know, I do a lot of work on the Japanese American incarceration and I've certainly at the very least encountered some questions. Uh, because so, you're not Japanese or why? Yeah. Oh. So I'm just I'm just curious about whether that's been a challenge for any of you. I mean, I feel like I'm speaking a lot, so I'll try to 
speak quickly. Um, so my first project was really about what people presume to be my community, which is on South Asian Americans. Um, and, and the dynamics there with regard to intra-ethnic would be more, less, there was a presumption that because I'm Indian American, I'm Indian and white, but the presumption was that I would have easy access to this community. And, um, and how would I access African Americans, right? Or because it was on hip hop. So the idea was that I would have to bridge this enormous divide, this, right? When in fact, my social worlds were populated with more black folks than there were South Asian American folks. So the issue with community um, for me was about how Indian Americans are dominant demographically, politically, um, and in representation when we think about South Asian America. So it was really about trying to figure out how to not replicate that um, by just giving voice to Indian American rappers or DJs by also talking about Sri Lankan Americans and Pakistani Americans. And so those were kind of the intra-ethnic issues about not wanting to re um, replicate who is dominant within any South Asian or Asian American category, and then people's presumptions about who we have access to racially and ethnically. Yeah, thank you, Natasha. I, if, I, if I can jump in, I, I feel like it's so easy for, you know, for me to be kind of, um, you know, uh, kind of subsumed by this group of like, you know, Indian American. Uh, literally, I write poems where I'm like, I am not Indian and still reviewers call me Indian American. And I'm like, this is not it. Like, you know, there's South, South Asian descent. Like, what does that mean? Even the idea of Asian American gives a lot of Gu indo guyanese a lot of uh, people from the Caribbean questions. Like, what does that mean exactly? Like, are, is this really your space? Um, and so, you know, it's one of those, uh, the, the things I, I can imagine about building alliances. And I really like, you know, Natasha, what you're saying about pushing back in that way. And I think that like the more voices that are out there that can complicate this narrative, definitely what South Asian is, what Asian American and Asians, Asians in the Americas, uh, mm -hmm. you know, as as uh, we are, my family is, um, you know, my various, uh, var my various people are. Um, uh, I think that the more this kind of, uh, these tensions will uh, look different, you know, as, as, we have more uh, poets, definitely translators, et cetera, thinkers, writers in the United States. I'm just, uh, it's a fascinating question. I, I've been kind of grappling with, um, and a lot for, in my own experience, especially coming from Canada, South Asian contexts are much more dominant than East Asian contexts. And so South Asian Canadian, you know, writers are huge, like, um, uh, um, I'm totally blanking on all of their names right now, but, um, uh, but uh, uh, the point being that, you know, by giving visibility to East Asian context was, it sort of flipped in an Asian American context where East Asians are sort of perceived to be sort of dominant to occupy the, the classification of Asian America much more and that South Asian American contexts are sort of, to quote the title of that book, apart yet apart, uh, mm -hmm. and not quite sort of a, sort of an uneasy fit within this pan-ethnic designation. Um, and so I, 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 so your your observation about sort of thinking about these inter-ethnic issues just reminded me of, of that, particularly because I usually am thinking across at least one or two nations. And so I'm thinking about the way that race, you know, and ethnicity really shift across time and space um, and into these different classifications. Um, the, but uh, probably it's, it's interesting that you say that you were having issues with Japanese American context, because I feel like in many ways, I'm much more of a scholar of, of Sinophobia, perhaps, you know, I'm sort of slowly realizing that because I think that it kind of animates the way that I approach other ethnic groups, particularly other East Asian and maybe Southeast Asian groups, because I think that there's something to, you know, that a lot of the ideas that I have about Asian racialization are kind of rooted in a kind of global Sinophobia. So um, th this is not an answer to your question, but, um, but it's interesting how, we're, where our interests take us and, and how we end up maybe not, you know, aligning, I suppose. However, as a mixed race person, I never really align <laughs> with anything anyways. And so it's like a, a kind of a comfortable position for me to be in. Thank you all. That was really interesting. Um, let, let's keep poking at problems. So uh, what are, 
some of the challenges that you faced and no doubt triumphantly surmounted um, in doing Asian American work, um, either personally or professionally. Rajiv, you wanna start us off? Sure, the first thing that comes to my mind and this, I, excuse me if this is a little like, um, you know, fast and loose, but um, I was thinking about this and, you know, being on the, the job market for an academic position, maybe it's like faux pas to talk about, I don't know, but like, let's demystify some stuff real quick. Um, because while I was like searching for my first tenure track position, um, what I would find myself doing is looking for, looking to see what was available, um, you know, and where. And if they had a brown body on the faculty in the English department where creative writing is taught, or if there were other Asian American folks there and thinking in my head that, if there were, if there was some kind of Asian American representation, then my chances would have lessened because still in departments across the United States, you know, the, we are, we are like the, um, you know, the, the, the chutney on the side. Um, yeah, we've got one, we don't need another one. Precisely. Yeah. Like, oh, this person can do the thing. And like, even though like, you know, you're completely different. We don't see that. In fact, we see you as tracked in this kind of way. So that's one of the ways that I see, like the, the one of the challenges that I see. The other one is about like, um, uh, thinking about making a platform for people who are poets, who are, you know, Asian from the Caribbean, um, living in the United States has been complicated in that uh, it's not a very, it's not a conversation that loads of people are having outside of say New York City or Fort Lauderdale or um, you know, even Toronto for that matter. Um, uh, and so that's, that's something particularly challenging that I, a particular challenge that I, I just, I mentioned before about like being read a certain way and always like having that particularity kind of taken out, like the whole like transit through servitude, um, you know, erased from my, my, my epigenetic memory. Um, when I'm considered as a person in the space. Aiko, Natasha, personal or professional challenges that you feel comfortable sharing? Where do we start? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we should have gotten in some of the elders of Asian American studies. We'd be here all night. <laughs> Natasha, you want to go? No, you, you go, you go. Um, I guess um, just as, I mean, I think just even um, the, the perception, which is this is where academia meets, I guess, brought the broader kind of <clears throat> mainstream perceptions of Asian America, but just this perception of Asian Americans as model minorities <clears throat> and therefore kind of outside of, or almost white or that they shouldn't be considered people of color, uh, that they kind of exist outside of systems of uh, white supremacy and racist oppression, um, you know? So I always feel that there's a narrative though, which I also kind of am uneasy with that you're always trying to prove that Asian Americans are somehow oppressed. So remember the internment, remember. <laughs> yeah, and so it, which seems weird as well. And, uh, and um, we can kind of talk about that. But again, this has to do with the sort of difficulties of the pan-ethnic term, uh, which is very different. There's no geographical linguistic kind of cohesion to this political project, which we call Asian American studies. So um, I feel like um, that that is difficult, particularly for people outside of the field. And as we have been seeing with the uptick in Asian anti-Asian violence, like literally nobody in the United States links Asian America to you know, to the deeply interwoven structures of immigration reform, to ideas about citizenship, to kind of racialized injustice. It's like sort of like people just don't even make those connections at all. So it's almost as if that stuff never happened. And so you're constantly reciting, you know, Asian American Studies 101. Um, and so I, so those are some of the difficulties and those difficulties transfer over into academic spaces where they don't count Asian American students as students of color sometimes, or they don't, you know what I mean? So, um, which certainly varies when you're talking about schools on the East Coast versus schools on the West Coast. Um, so anyways, there's a whole host of issues, um, I think it, that relate to faculty diversity, to, um, 
um, a whole range of issues that are that affect us professionally that are related to um, uh, this no the, the model minority myth and also this notion that this sort of ignorance around uh, Asian American history. Yeah, there's that, you know, it's it's curricular and then it also affects us in our career trajectories as well, right? Because Asian American studies, it's such a vibrant field. But when you go to that conference and then you go to some other conferences, you realize how small it is and how institutionally underrepresented it is. And I've always felt like in a way I, I have it very easy because, you know, my first book is about dead white authors. And so I kind of have that validation professionally and even in my own department or my own institution, right? It's like, well, you know, I teach Faulkner, I work on Faulkner, but I don't want to have to have that kind of validation, right? Like that shouldn't be the thing that justifies me also working on Asian American literature as if I have to have some kind of, you know, authenticating letter in order to be able to do that work and be taken seriously. It's interesting, just, just to jump in, it seems almost as if anti-Asian violence ends up being the justification for Asian American studies. And so, or similarly for anti-Black violence, you know, after George Floyd's murder, we see an uptick in, in ads for, you know, jobs focusing on carceral studies, et cetera. So, I mean, this is, <laughs> this is a very, um, an informed way of thinking about why these fields matter. You know, they, they matter outside of the immediate, you know, context of anti-Asian violence, anti-Blackness, you know, so, um, so I just wanted to add that. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm, I mean, when I think about intellectually, the kinds of con uh, conversations that I've hoped to contribute, to have contributed to, um, you know, back in the day when we were in grad school and undergrad, you know, uh, I'm I'm glad that I hope that my work has kind of been part of this discourse where we can understand Asian Americans as racialized, right? We're not just ethnic and cultural beings, but that we have to take part in the national conversation and global conversation on race. And the other part intellectually that I am, you know, um, invested in is really thinking about Asian and Black relationality. But speaking about the job market and um, having that... Uh, you know, how Eminem needs Dr. Dre. So Heidi Kim needed her Faulkner or whoever, right? Uh, so the wonderful space of ethnic studies within the academy. So for instance, I'm directing Asian American studies. And so I don't have to be the only Asian American or Asian Americanist. And um, what's been really critical in our program at Northwestern is, you know, for the last 15 years, because because we're not granted many tenure lines, uh, we're constantly searching for temporary workers. Um, and so we've had like 15 or 16 uh, interview, you know, hires in the last 15 years. But what I'm very proud about is that our Asian American studies program really highlights Filipino American studies, Southeast Asian American studies, South Asian studies, and West Asian studies. And so in that way, it really, I mean, we're talking about populations here, but I think it offers, um, kind of the negative counterpoint to the dominant notion of, of what Asian American, what Asian American studies is. And so it talks really about race and imperialism and war and the Pacific and indigeneity. Um, and those are our, our foci, our focuses. And I think that's been really something I've been um, a strong, trying to be a strong advocate of as an administrator of an Asian American studies program is to really give a different kind of blueprint for what that looks like, at least at one institution. That's amazing and really inspiring. <laughs> I'm so, worn out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can empathize. We all are. So Turning from the problems to the project, right? This is the fun part when you're when you're kind of dreaming up your project. And well, maybe we've all had a little too much solitude this year, but working, you know, really digging into the project in your own mind. Um, how do you all, and you can illustrate this by talking about a specific project or by talking about your process if you have one, um, but how do you all go about really identifying the heart of your project and how do you locate your subjects or your data, you know, as, as the case may be, 
um, or the scholars and artists who you want to be in conversation with. Give us a blueprint. Go on, Rajiv. Okay, because I'm like, there's two things that I can say here. <clears throat> um, with my collection of poems that's come, that, that, that are, that's forthcoming in September, um, it's very much based on uh, music from my childhood. So there's a singer from the, the, the 1960s and 70s called Sundar Popo who developed, who was like on that, he, he's one of the four parents of Chutney music. And um, he sang this song, Kaise Bani, which was then um, redone by an Indian duo from, from India and then exported throughout the whole of the Indian labor diaspora. So people in Fiji, South Africa, Mauritius, um, you know, all throughout the Caribbean also knew this song. Um, and I was thinking, uh, as I was reading work by American poets, um, such as C.D. Wright um, in um, Cooling Time, an American uh, vigil uh, for poetry, um, I was really inspired to think about what are those poetic forms that are kind of like forms that are part of my, my home. Um, that are not necessarily written, written forms. Um, my parents were educated, my parents can read and write, um, and th th my father is the first generation of the literate in his family. And so a lot of our, oral, a lot of our traditions are oral. Um, and so thinking about that, I've created a kind of a form of poem called the Chutney poem that updates the speaker to a queer brown person living in Queens. So I was talking about, I, I think about like how that can elucidate the affective life of, you know, a Caribbean queer in a city transplanted many times over. Um, and it's a migration through sound, through song, yes, but also through languages as it's also like written in and out of three different languages. So that's one kind of like creative project that I, I see myself so much in, um, you know, my, my personal investment in a different kind of artistic way than would be another project that I'm working on simultaneously, which is a, um, I mean, an anthology, that's the, that's not quite the right word, but a collection of retranslations of Chutney songs that have been important to me and then to the people who um, I have asked to translate. And so it's about 20 people that I've asked to translate and retranslate and then to uh, create new poems based on a poetic that they see um, and putting those together has been a real, um, you know, there's somebody here, Anita Baksh, who's here, Dr. Anita Baksh, who's here, is in, in this project, and so I'm so glad that she's here. Uh, but uh, one of the things that I've been doing is thinking about, you know, how indeed do I locate the people that I want to ask for this, you know, and then I think about, you know, who, who is in my intellectual community, you know, who are the, the, the Caribbean writers, or the Indo-Caribbean writers that I, uh, that that I am, you know, either awed by or talking to, or who are drag queens that I adore, or who are people that, you know, have no actual academic interface either, um, you know, as well. I wanted it to be kind of like a broad, a broad kind of reading of people that I hold very dear, and um, that's that's one of the things that I do. And you know, it's been enabled so much through Facebook, through Zoom conferences, through like drag performances that people. Um, you know, record on their phones and upload to YouTube. So this is this is kind of how these two projects I've kind of like blueprinted for myself. And then the obsession with the music, of course. <laughs> yeah, speaking of the obsession of music or with music is, um, you know, when I talk to particularly PhD students who are going to embark on a multi-year commitment, right? It, uh, and as they define their projects and also for undergrads who are creating their senior thesis project, you know, I really highlight passion. Like you have to be passionate about it. I mean, it might not get done unless you're instrumental about it, but you have to be, ideally you'd be passionate about it and you study something you love that runs the risk of ruining what you love. So like, you know, like academic, taking academics to a movie is never fun because all we do is critique, critique, critique. Right. Um, but so, so my first, you know, my dissertation was brought, 
my love of hip hop uh, for the long term. It ended up being a 10 year long project, right? And so um, I was trained in a field anthropology that I, that wasn't conducive to to understanding or validating that I wanted to do a project on race, on the United States, and on hip hop. And so I found a home in ethnic studies. So sometimes we're not in the right fields, but we know that we have to sort of understand and remember that we're passionate about this project and that it's important, even if our field does not make us feel that that is important. Um, and then. Um, you know, I think Raji was just speaking about home for my second project. Um, and with the first project, it didn't really matter what field I was in because ethnic studies to me was so open and was okay with whatever I was doing, whereas anthropology was not. For this current book that's done on um, Black residents of Hawaii, um, I'm not Black and I'm not Native Hawaiian, uh, but I am from Hawaii. And so home was really the passion part of it. But I, I really centered Black people because of my institutional location in Black studies. So I don't know to what extent I feel that it was my responsibility to sort of speak to the field as someone in Black studies, even though I already had tenure. But I know that that shaped it. So sometimes um, the field that we are in, the discipline that we're in might shape a project. But again, that passion piece, I think, is really critical and being able to come home all of these years, just logistically to be able to have research funds to come from Chicago to Hawaii to bring my family here. It's a 10 year project. So again, thinking about home and passion and our fields, all of those things together, I think inform the way that I, I do my projects. Um, yeah, it's a very difficult uh, process, you know, d defining and, and uh, homing in on something that you're going to commit years and years of, of your time and effort and tears, uh, uh, you know, consumed by. Uh, for me, I think that just, you know, to add to uh, what's been said before, I think that I see it kind of as, you know, I'm always trying to sort of ask different questions, you know? Um, and then, so I've asked like a question like, why does it seem that black, the death of black women is sort of ungrievable? That might be a question that I have. And so from that point, I'm sort of thinking about, look, I look immediately to artwork actually to, um, to give me a sort of, to help me theorize, to, to show me unexpected things. Um, because I really do think that artwork can be sort of this hermeneutic space that really in some ways either reminds you of something that's on the margins of your consciousness or you know really magical things can happen so I'm always consuming um, a lot of artwork or cultural production of, of different sorts and then it's kind of like an audition process because I'm like well if I look at this artwork it takes me down this road and then um, and so I audition these different <laughs> works and sometimes years later I will have a different question and I'll remember a different artwork and then um and then that will be the answer in some ways to a, a, a different question that i might have but it's it, you know it's not a it's it's not a systematic process but i do find that um my at least at this point reflecting um i just wanted to say how important for me um consuming um visiting lots of galleries and consuming a lot of artwork is for helping me generate new kind of new ways of understanding something or different ways of constructing meaning. So I'll say that. I love that. It's a lifelong curation. If there are any questions for our entire slate of panelists, I think we can take one or two before we go to breakout rooms. Any general questions that anyone would like to ask? And you're welcome to drop them in the chat if you prefer. All right, I don't see any. Um, so if there aren't any coming in, then I want to say thank you to all three of our Asian American Center fellows, Aiko Day, Natasha Sharma, Rajiv Mohabir. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'll stop the 